John Gabriel, and welcome to the show. We've got an amazing guest for you today. His name is Dr. Howard Leibowitz, and I'll just tell you a little bit about Dr. Leibowitz. Dr. Leibowitz was trained in internal medicine at the University of Southern California and worked as an emergency and trauma physician for over 20 years. He served as the medical director at the Centinella Hospital Fitness Institute, testing professional athletes like the Lakers, the Clippers, the Dodgers, and also the PGA Golf Tour. He was the team direct doctor for the Pioneer Triathlon Team, a professional triathlon team, and he served as the, on the medical board of the TriFed, which is the governing body of the triathlon sport. He was a member of the advisory board of Bally Health and Tennis and 24-Hour Fitness, and he also worked as a physician at the Pritikin Longevity Center, where I happen to have spent two years, <clears throat> a couple of weeks while I was trying to lose weight. <clears throat> He's been a lifelong athlete himself, a college swimmer, and later a triathlete. He competed in the grueling Hawaiian Ironman three times. His experience with integrative and functional medicine, along with his foundational approach to health through nutrition, has helped him realize the importance of assessing and balancing hormones for both men and women. He's combined years of experience and knowledge to help women through, through the hormonal transition of menopause, as well as male, men with hormonal decline. His unique approach to attaining optimal health, as well as slowing the aging process, has helped, him, has helped innumerable men and women, also many celebrities. And um, Dr. Leibowitz is also, I, I kind of, a good friend of mine, I call him my big brother in health and fitness. You know, we, we met... Uh, to, we met uh, a year ago in Los Angeles, and everyone thought he was my brother. We look like brothers, only he's a little bit taller, a little bit fitter, and a little bit smarter. Uh, but let me let me bring him in, Dr. Leibowitz. Are you there? Yeah. Hi, John. How are you? That's a very nice introduction. I'm good. How are you? Yeah, really great. I can't believe it. I can't believe it's been a year. Has it been a year? Uh, actually, it might have. Yes, it's been. It's, it's almost a year. It was January when we met. That's yeah. But wow. it, it was, nice. I don't know if you remember, it was really like that. You know, we were at a, we had a table of about 12 people and everyone kept asking us if we were brothers. So, it was, so uh, yeah, it was I do remember nice. that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we've there got, must be a heritage somewhere. <laughs> somewhere like that. Yeah. So <clears throat> we do, we definitely think alike. There's, there's no question. I, I, I have to tell yeah. you for, for those listening, Dr. Leibowitz's approach is an amazing holistic balance of combining medicine, nutrition, stress reduction. We're very, very similar to the Gabriel method. So, um, so, so, so we've got a lot of questions that people have typed in. Also, if you want to ask a question, you can see the call-in number on the page there. You call in, and you have to press 1 to let us know that you want to ask a question, you can, and you can talk to Dr. Leibowitz live. But we've got a lot of people that have typed in questions, which we'll get to. But I've got a few questions first, Howard. So my, my first question is, someone walks into your office, and, and let's say they're middle-aged, they're overweight. What do you do? What are the steps that you take? The first thing is I, I always get a blood panel before I see them. So, um, and that includes for women, it's all the female hormones. I get FSH, which is a pituitary hormone. And then I get their estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. I look at their thyroid. Um, if I can, I'll get a 24-hour urine and look at their adrenal glands because that's always very, very helpful for me. And then um, I talk to them and get to know them a little bit and get to understand what their lifestyle is like, what their diet is like, uh, what their job is like, what their stress factors are like, how much sleep they're getting, what toxins they might be exposed to. And things like that. And then, you know, it, it takes a while to get all this information and really start to decipher what I need to do to help them to get healthier. Right. All right. So let's start with menopause because that's such, that's such a big topic. What is it about menopause that causes you, women to gain weight? Well, the, the primary <laughs> issue with menopause is women lose their hormones. Their ovaries that naturally make estrogen and progesterone and testosterone actually stop functioning completely in menopause, don't make any more hormones at all, and then women's hormones just plummet, suddenly plummet. It's not overnight. Um, it actually can take up to 10 years. Some women will start their pre-menopause 10 years before they hit menopause, but when they stop having periods, they virtually aren't making any more hormones, and when this happens in the body, you know, I like to talk about all the hormones being like a symphony orchestra. They're all in balance with each other. So when all the hormone, all the female hormones disappear like that, it creates a tremendous imbalance right off the bat. And any imbalance in the body is stressful. 
And what happens is it triggers the adrenal glands to kick in in a stress mode. And you and I have talked about this a lot, you know, the fight or flight kind of response of the adrenal glands can come from almost anything. And losing hormones is one of those uh, stressors that can trigger uh, the fight or flight kind of response. So the hot flashes, the night sweats, all those things are what we call vasomotor symptoms, and they're actually due to cortisol. Okay. So a lot of women, uh, when they hit this, when they hit this period of their lives, they become insulin resistant, uh, and I know, I know you've you've talked about that a lot. Yeah. And uh, when women become insulin resistant, um, they just don't metabolize carbohydrates and, and calories very well, and a lot of what they eat gets turned into fat, and they have a very very hard time to lose weight. And in addition to that, because of the stress and the cortisol. They have cravings for sugar, so yeah. it's like a double whammy. They 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 want sugar, they eat carbs, they eat sugar, and they can't lose weight, and and everything is just haywire. That's a nutshell of what what happens, you know, to women's metabolism and menopause. Okay, so now are you saying that it's the that it's the the elevated cortisol level that's causing the insulin resistance, or are there other hormone imbalances that are causing the insulin resistance? Well, it's the other hormones imbalance that creates the, I mean, the mechanism with, that creates the insulin resistance is first the female hormones are out of balance. Yeah. And then the body's compensation for that is to develop insulin resistance. Yeah. Because cortisol will cause insulin resistance also. And so, so having the adrenal glands kick in will cause the insulin resistance. And I just want to say for people listening, insulin resistance will cause you to gain weight for a number of reasons because you lose the ability to burn fat. You get, you get, uh, junk food cravings. You get tired. Uh, you get low blood sugar episodes. Um, and, and if it's, and if it gets worse, it, it becomes type 2 diabetes. So th- this is, this is a real marker that weight gain, that, that you're going to be gaining weight if you get insulin resistance. So on the one hand, the cortisol can cause the insulin resistance, but you're also saying the hormonal imbalance on its own will, will cause the body's response to that will be an insulin resistance. Well, it's probably right? through the cortisol mechanism. I don't think okay. the lack of the hormones themselves. Now, having high hormones can produce insulin resistance. For instance, women on birth control pills, not all women, but many women on birth control pills gain weight. And uh, women who are taking hormones, a lot of women I see come to me after they've been to another doctor and they're being given hormones, and they're not being given hormones in a normal rhythm. They're just being given both estrogen and progesterone every day. And that's a pattern that we see in pre- pregnancy, and that too creates insulin resistance. So high that's levels of con- continuous progesterone can cause insulin resistance also. And it might it might right. all come down to... It might all come down to the adrenal glands. You know, I think the mechanism of, of unbalanced hormones is probably through the stress, the stress channels in the body. Yeah. Well, you know, the, I've heard that estrogen, high estrogen levels can cause insulin resistance. Is that right? You know, I'm not sure if it's the estrogen itself or if it's the imbalance. Uh, because I have okay. women, I have women that I'm replacing hormones for who actually have quite high levels of estrogen and they're not insulin resistant. Okay. You know, they're because their other hormones are balanced and they're and they're eating right and they're getting enough sleep and you know they don't have any other stressors. One of the other things about menopause also that exacerbates the problem is when these women lose their hormones and develop night sweats and hot flushes, they don't sleep and they get yeah. sleep deprived and that also is yeah. another stress added on the body. That, that, that is definitely that is definitely true. So so what do you do? Like what, what do you do to balance the hormones when your their body stops producing hormones? How do you rebalance that? Well, luckily, we have uh, what are termed bioidentical hormones, and the definition of a bioidentical hormone is a hormone that is chemically identical to our own hormones that we make, and it's, and it's f- physiologically works the same. That's, that's a bioidentical hormone. They come from yams. It can sometimes be extracted from soy, but most of the ones are coming from yams these days. Why yams have the same hormones as humans, I have no idea, but whoever discovered <laughs> this is a genius, you know. Yeah. They're there, and, and people will ask me sometimes, oh, can I just eat a lot of yams and I'll yeah, have my yeah. hormones back? And I no, you'd have to eat, like, truckloads of yams to get the hormones you need. And that's going to cause <laughs> anyway, a lot of other problems that you don't want. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, I, you know, we have these hormones now. They're bioidentical, so the body recognizes them, accepts them, 
They don't cause any disturbance. And we put, I put them back in the body in the same pattern that women had them before they, they went into menopause. So I try to get the body back into the balance that it naturally had. And usually when I'm able to restore the missing hormones, it's like putting a, a, a key in the lock and turning the lock and everything works. What's different about that than when, you know, a, a, a lady goes to a normal doctor and she just, and just gives him, she, the doctor just gives her hormones like estrogen and progesterone. What's, well, what's the what, difference between that, your approach and that? What a lot of doctors do, um, and, and I believe it's due, it's due to their lack of understanding of the physiology of menopause. But what a lot of doctors do is they treat symptoms. They treat the surface. They don't go down into the functional aspect of the problem, and they don't try to correct the problem from its source. They just treat the symptoms. So the symptoms that come in to his office, that our patients will come into the office with are you know, lack of sleep, night sweats, hot flashes, sugar cravings, gaining weight, things like that. So the doctor will go, oh, you're in menopause. Here, take these hormones. And it'll give her estrogen and progesterone, and it'll just say, take these every day, and, and you'll feel better. And, and he doesn't pay any attention to the physiology of the body. Well, if you've ever looked at the estrogen curve of a woman before menopause, I'm not kidding. It looks like a roller coaster. It doesn't stay the same every day. It's up, it's yeah. down, it's up, it's down, and from day to day, it's not the same. Now, I don't believe we absolutely have to follow that pattern, but we have to follow, you know, the general pattern of, of the hormones. And the other thing that's very, very important is women do not have progesterone every day. They only have progesterone for half of the cycle. So they have progesterone for two weeks, and then they have no progesterone for two weeks. And a lot of doctors, most doctors who are treating menopause today, they give women progesterone every single day. And the only time that women have progesterone every single day like that is during a pregnancy. And I'm sure you know, and a lot of people know, about what I used to call the diseases of pregnancy. And one of them is insulin resistance and what we used to call gestational diabetes. And, you know, women will have a seven-pound baby, and they'll gain 45 pounds, you know. Yeah. And it, it's, all, it's all due to insulin resistance. That's, that's right. So when I, when I give women their hormones back, I pay attention to these rhythms, and I give them their estrogens in varying doses, and I only give them progesterone for two weeks of the month, two weeks on, two weeks off, two weeks on, two weeks off. Most of the patients I'm treating get some kind of a period, and that's actually normal. It's to be expected. Yeah. If you put the hormones back the way they were, the body is responding the way it's supposed to, and that's actually a good sign that the hormones are working is women will get a small period every month. Well, uh, that approach is, I think, is also really brilliant for another reason, and that is that, as you know, when you just artificially induce and increase a hormone level on a consistent basis, the body will build a tolerance to that hormone and will become resistant to that hormone. And that's exactly, for example, if you're if you're suffering from elevated insulin levels and for and you eat a lot of foods that elevate your insulin levels, it's just going to make your insulin resistance worse. The, the same, and your body's going to stop listening to insulin the same way that if you were in a, in a concert and the music was real loud, your body, your, your ears would become deaf to, to the music. Your, our cells actually become deaf to certain hormones. And if you raise them consistently all the time, then you're going to, you're going to develop a cellular resistance to it and it's going to work against you. So, so, so by mixing up, varying the, the quantities and the degrees and the timing of the hormones that you're, that you're exposing pe- women to, it'll, it'll prevent them from developing that, that resistance. Does that, well, that make sense? A matter, it's also a matter of putting the body back the way it was programmed and designed. Because right. if you don't, right. if you do something arbitrary that has nothing to do with normal physiology, you create an imbalance. And any time you create an right. imbalance in the body, you're going to create an adrenal cortisol response. And cortisol right. is, is an anti-insulin hormone. Cortisol right. will suppress the function of insulin. So right. you don't want to raise cortisol because then your insulin doesn't work. And that creates insulin right. resistance. Right. It also so, creates it also crea- uh, creates leptin resistance, which which leptin is sort of the master hormone of mm-hmm. a, of, of weight of weight gain or, or regulating your body weight. And if you get a leptin resistance, not only do you get insulin resistance, but your metabolism slows down, 
and uh, and you become you start to crave junk food all the time, and, you, mm-hmm. and you, your stomach doesn't listen to your brain when you're when you're full. So it's a it's a vicious vicious cycle. But so so just going back to those women that you're treating, they start to have their period again. Now for how long? That's the big unanswered question, and you know there's a lot of data being done, research being done on hormones right now. But, you know, we do not have all the answers in terms of long-term safety. I wish we did. And I tell my patients this. And there are studies that are being done now. There's actually a study ongoing in France. They're they're following 50,000 women in France on bioidentical hormones. And I don't know if they're giving them to them rhythmically, which is what I was talking about, where you vary the dose. I don't know if that's being done. But they are using bioidentical hormones. And they're not giving them to to the women orally. Now, a lot of hormones that have been used in the past were oral hormones, and they were they came out of horses. They were pregnant horses, mm. urine extracted hormones. So these are hormones that the horses don't even want. They're urinating <laughs> them out, <laughs> and then someone's concentrating them, putting them into pills, and having these women yeah. gobble down these hormone pills. So what happens is it's called first pass through the liver. So the hormones are going from yeah. the stomach. They're going into the portal venous blood supply, whammo, directly into the liver. Well, our livers were never designed to handle that much hormone at one time. You know, we were designed to handle small doses of hormone. The liver metabolizes the hormones and breaks them down and all of that. So you develop all sorts of abnormal responses in the liver in addition to the adrenals and everything else, and you end up with clotting problems and high blood pressure problems and stroke problems. And then they say from that, they're going, well, hormones are bad for you. Well, of course they're bad for you. If you take horse hormones and you put them in a pill and you eat them, yeah, they're going to be bad for you. (laughs) But, you know, the bioidenticals are not like that. They don't go through your stomach. They're creams. We put them on the skin. They absorb through the skin. They go into the bloodstream little by little, you know, as your body... You know, blood as your blood supply goes through your skin, it picks up hormones little by little. So the dosing of the hormones is much more similar to what the ovaries did, and they're bioidentical. So they get into the body in a very, very similar fashion. Now, I wish I could say, you know, that these are completely safe, but unfortunately, no one's done this before. Our generation, the baby boomer generation, is the first generation that's doing this. And we're kind of yeah. like the explorers, you know, out in outer space. No one's been there before. When we're in our 90s, you know, we'll have the answers. And the next generation yeah. behind us will know yeah. um, if they're safe. But the study that's ongoing in France, the 50,000 women, so far what they're finding, and the study's been going on I think at least 10 years, what they're finding with these bioidentical hormones is that you have not seen any increase in breast cancer. Mm-hmm. So... At least they're not causing more breast cancer like everybody thinks the hormones will. Yeah. You know, yeah. So that what, is a very good early sign. And what are you finding with your, with your own patients? Well, I've had a few women you know, be diagnosed uh, with breast cancer, but you will. I mean, uh, breast cancer doesn't start overnight. And, yeah, you know, no, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about that in general, uh, just, I'm just talking about in general, the overall health of the, oh, of the women that you're treating this way. M- m- I would say 90% plus of the women I'm treating, they feel phenomenal. And, and I talk to women in their follow-ups and one of the most, you know, satisfying things for me, gratifying things in my practice is women will, will say to me, you know, they haven't felt this good in 20 years and they lose weight. They can sleep again, their skin is nice again, their hair is nice again, they have a libido, they have vaginal lubrication, they can have intercourse, you know, they're just much, much happier people. Yeah. So, okay, so, so let me ask you, so what about male hormone decline? Let's talk about, a little bit about that. Tell me a little bit what male hormone decline is, why it is, and what happens when it happens. Well, men are very, very different than women on that regard because they don't, go into what we call a menopause. And one of the big misunderstandings and the term that's being thrown around that I really do not like is what they call andropause. And there is no such thing as andropause. It's what I call male hormone decline. And there's no cutesy little word that you can just label it with. It's just male hormone decline. As we get older, our hormones decline. Our, our, all of our glands make less hormone as we get older. And men in their 50s and their 60s or so, 
will probably start to experience, not all men, but some men will start to experience some symptoms that are similar to women's menopausal symptoms. And this is where the crossover happens that causes confusion, is that some of the symptoms are similar. Men can actually have night sweats and hot flashes and things like that. Primarily, men will get grumpy and irritable, and their libidos will go down, and their strength will go down, and their muscle mass will go down, and their metabolism changes, and they start to get fat, and they lose their bulk, and they put on fat, and they have low motivation, and their thought processes change, and they have foggy thinking, and all sorts of things like that. And then other things start to change in terms of their physiology. Their cholesterol numbers start to change, and their risk of heart disease starts to go up, and their blood pressure goes up. And they also develop insulin resistance, and they can become diabetic. So, so, uh, so what, is, what are some of the treatments for, for men? Well, men are much easier than women. It's because men are much simpler. I don't know if you've ever seen the analogy. <laughs> if you ever go to a hormone lecture, a uh, hormone replacement lecture, they show this, um, they'll show like the dashboard of a 747 with all the buttons and switches and the lights, and they'll go, this is, this is a woman, this is a woman's brain. And then they'll show you another picture, and it's a little toggle switch on, off. And they're going, this is a man's <laughs> and, yeah, you know, I think, that, I think that, that analogy applies to a lot of things, probably. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's really cute. And, yeah. you know, in a funny way, it's really kind of true. Men are very, very stable. Men don't have swings in hormones up and down. They don't have different hormones at different parts of the month. They just have testosterone. And, you know, men are kind of like chugging down the, the, the tracks. You know, they kind of go straight ahead. They don't go right. They don't go left. They just go straight ahead. And it's because their hormones really don't vary very much. So it's, it's fairly simple to replace men's hormones. You just put them on some testosterone and get their levels up to physiologically good levels. And sometimes they need things like DHEA, and I, I get everybody on vitamin D these days because everybody's missing vitamin D. And men, it's amazing. You put that testosterone back in them, and they feel phenomenal. Sometimes I look so at growth hormone. Yeah. Do, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. I look at growth hormone, but so, that's not specifically male. That's both men and women. Uh, it's another hormone that declines. And, you know, the important thing when I look at hormones in men and women is to look at all the hormones because, yeah. like I said before, they are balanced like a symphony orchestra, and if you don't get them all playing at the right pitch with each other, you still create imbalances. So I look at the thyroid, I look at the growth hormone, I look at the DHEA, I look at the adrenal gland, I look at vitamin D, and if anything is missing, I'll support it and get it balanced. And when I do that, you know, the men feel fantastic also. I mean, they, they, everything comes back. All the function that they felt they were losing comes back. Now, now when you give them, uh, is it the same thing? You give them bioidentical hormones as a cream? I can use a bioidentical testosterone as a cream. It's not my first choice because there's a little glitch in giving a, a testosterone cream to men. Men are very hairy in general. And when you rub cream on hairy parts of the body, the follicles of the hair converts the testosterone into another form of testosterone called dihydrotestosterone. Now, oh. a lot of people say dihydrotestosterone is not a problem. And there's actually some countries, country you're living in right now, actually, where the men like to take dihydrotestosterone and they rub it on their skin because they want high dihydrotestosterone levels because it's a very, very potent testosterone and it's a real stimulator for libido. But on the downside, what dihydrotestosterone can do is it can enlarge the prostate. It doesn't cause cancer or anything. It just enlarges the prostate and can cause some obstruction problems with urination. And it also can cause men to lose the hair on their head. It can exacerbate male pattern baldness. So I try to balance it. I try not to let it get too high. And when you use testosterone as a cream and the hair follicles, it tends to really jack up the dihydrotestosterone. We, we abbreviate it DHT, and DHT yeah. gets very high in some men, and uh, it can cause some, some problems. So my first choice for testosterone, if the men will tolerate it, is to do injectable testosterone. And they just, I teach men how to give themselves a shot, and they take a shot of testosterone. It's a tiny little amount of oil and a little, little tiny needle, and they stick it in their thigh, and they give themselves a shot once a week, and they'll have great testosterone all the time. 
And it's that simple. Okay. All right. So, so let me just get, you, you mentioned vitamin D a couple of times. How, how does vitamin D fit into all this? Well, vitamin D is, first of all, vitamin D is made in our skin. And uh, it's, it's, it's really a beautiful system, and it fits so well into the Paleolithic model of everything. Yeah. Um, you know, if you look at, uh, uh, you look at uh, anthropology and you look at different peoples and the color of their skin at different latitudes of the world, where they originated from, you'll find that people living closer to the equator have darker skin. And as people living further up towards the north and south poles, they have lighter and lighter and more fair skin. And the reason for this is because of vitamin D. If your skin is very dark, if you're living in a very intensely sunny place, like in Africa, close to the equator, you do not want fair skin. First of all, it's going to burn. And secondly, you know, you, you won't be able to protect yourself from the rays of, harmful rays of the sun and you, and your vitamin D levels will go through the, through the roof. So your skin is darker, which tends to filter the sun. And that tends to keep your vitamin D levels at a better level. If you're very, very fair, uh, you know, you should be living further away from the, I mean, if you're, if you're fair, you want to be living further away from the sun so that you can pick up as much sunlight as you possibly can. So you look at people in the poles, the Scandinavian people and, and people like that, they're very, very light skin and that skin absorbs as much sun as possible. It's for vitamin D production. So. The issue with vitamin D is it's, it's integral to so many things in the body. It has a big impact on sugar metabolism. It has an impact on moods, depression, uh, tremendous impact on inflammation and preventing disease and helping support the immune system. There were studies done in Norway, I think in Norway or Finland, on children, and they found that uh, babies born to mothers who were vitamin D deficient had something like a 40% increased incidence of diabetes. And when they gave those mothers vitamin D during their pregnancy, the incidence of uh, diabetes dropped by like 30, 40%. It was incredible. Yeah. yeah. And, and it I, has I just, a huge... I, I just want to make a, yeah. I just, I just want to make a note about that that's really important for us for weight loss, and that is about inflammation. And that is that the hormones that, that cause inflammation, they're called, they're called pro-inflammatory cytokines, they also cause insulin and leptin resistance and cause you to gain weight. So by getting vitamin D, you're lowering those, the, the levels of those hormones and then increasing your insulin sensitivity and your leptin sensitivity, and it makes it much easier to lose weight. So vitamin D is truly integral to, to losing weight. I, I had read somewhere recently that the vitamin D that we absorb in our skin is a little bit different than the vitamin D that you take as a supplement. One is the, the one on our skin is, a, is water sol soluble, so it goes right through the bloodstream and acts the way it's supposed to. And then the, the supplement is, is fat soluble and needs, and needs a, a, lip, a lipoprotein to, to travel through the, through the body. Is that, have you heard anything about that? Well, I know, you know, the supplement, I've always learned the vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. I, I, I wasn't aware of the uh, difference in the, the, with vitamin D that we make in our skin, but there are different types of vitamin D. You know, there's yeah. D1, D2, and D3. So what you might be yeah. referring to is one of the other um, subfractions of vitamin D. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right, so... Um... So, so what, what are some, like for going back to men for a second, what are some of the more nat, just natural without doing any type of hormone replacement, what are natural things that, that they can do to help prevent or, or retard the, the male, the hormonal decline? Well, I think in general, anybody who is overall healthier will tolerate the hormone decline better. Uh, preventing the hormone decline might be, might be somewhat difficult, um, but certainly if you're exposed to toxins, uh, if you're eating a poor diet, if you're not getting enough sleep and rest, and if you're not yeah. getting adequate exercise, all of those things are going to contribute to a more rapid hormone decline. And the men and, the, and women as well who do best with hormone replacement are the people who really have everything else in excellent shape and all they're yeah. missing is that one little link. So, mm -hmm. you know, sleeping well, eating well, avoiding carbs, avoiding sugars, eating paleolithically like you talk about all the time. I mean, the, the closer you can get to living that kind of a lifestyle and that kind of a model will tremendously uh, help avoid the issues of, of any hormone decline and tolerate it much, much better. 
I think, I think you're right. And also stress reduction because, you know, most of us are in a chronic state of mental and emotional stress. And dealing with, with stress is going to help your hormonal levels tremendously because, again, mm -hmm. stress is going to elevate your cortisol levels and cause all kinds of hormonal problems. So, mm -hmm. so when we, when we met last, last year, you told me about this really interesting idea for treating insulin resistance with an altitude machine. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. I, I, you, can, can you talk about that a little bit? Because I really yeah, I just love the idea. It's called, uh, it's called CVAC, C-V-A-C, and it stands yeah. for Cyclical Variations in Altitude Conditioning. And the theory behind it, uh, the guy who developed it, uh, his theory was also goes back to Paleolithic times, and his belief was that man used to be migratory, just like animals, and that man would follow herds of animals according to the seasons and that when the when the weather was warm man would come down to lower elevations and when the i mean uh, yeah and when the and the no the have the opposite when weather was yeah, when yeah, the weather yeah, was yeah. warm man would go They'd to go higher, higher elevations and when yeah. the weather got cold he would move down into lower elevations and and man was never a stagnant animal the way we are now so now we tend to live most of our lives um, at one elevation, unless you're doing a lot of traveling and things like that. But for most people, we don't do a lot of traveling. And um, he feels that that contributes to um, insulin resistance because the fluctuations in air pressure and oxygen tensions and things like that, uh, he believes, has an impact on how we metabolize carbs and sugar. I think there's a lot more to it than that, but that's part of his philosophy. I think we also ate different food at different seasons, which we don't tend to do anymore either. But all of this, you know, if we look back at Paleolithic man, we don't live hardly anything similar to the way he lived, and we're genetically uh, the same. So yeah. the... Well, the the altitude chamber, what it does is you sit in this chamber, it kind of looks like a little space capsule, and it, it, it raises and lowers the uh, altitude pressure. So it can take people up, he can take people up to 30,000 feet, there'll be no oxygen in there, but he can take yeah. people up that high, and, and you sit in there for 20 or 30 minutes a day, and he, and you get these variations in altitude, and, and he's noted when people do that, that they uh, metabolize carbs and sugars better, and it actually helps them lose weight. I, I love this idea. To, to me, this is so beautiful because you're not ingesting anything. You don't have to worry about the toxins or the way your body's processing it. It's just you're sitting in a machine that's changing variations in altitude, and by doing that, your body's becoming more sensitive to insulin. I just love the idea. Did, did, didn't you tell me that uh, he discovered it also from uh, watching uh, postmen in, uh, in Alaska or something like that? Um, there was a study done. Yeah, there was a study done. I think it was the postman because they fly a lot. And, yeah, and they fly uh, in open out. Uh, they fly in an uh, open, open unpressurized, cockpit, right? unpressurized yeah. airplane because they don't go that high. You know, they might go yeah. up to ten or twelve thousand feet, and they're in these little, you know, like puddle jumpers. You know, they're single engine yeah. planes, and they'll pop from island to island. You know, there are more airplanes in Alaska than any place else per capita in, in I think, in the world because there's yeah. very small, few roads, so people get around by airplane a lot. And those people, they, they studied them as a population, and they found that there was very, very little diabetes and very little obesity in, in these, in these, in these uh, people. I love it. And they figured it, it was probably due to the fact that they had variations in altitude. Where, where they would find, as compared to other people in Alaska, right? Yeah. Well, they're, they're constant. I just, I... You know, they're up and down multiple times a day. In so, so have you have you have you used this machine? Have you, are you is it part of your practice yet, or like have you looked into it anymore? Because I remember when we first talked about it, it was all new, and you had just we had just been it's you had just sort of discovered it, and I'm just wondering, have you had any experiments with it at all? Well, you know, it's very unfortunate. You know, as you know, I went through this divorce, and we had this phenomenal uh, health clinic here in Santa Monica. And the inventor was going to put one in my waiting room. <laughs> and I was yeah. going to really, I was going to offer it to all my patients. What a patients. great idea. Yeah. And then yeah. Um, with the divorce, the clinic was closed. So I lost that opportunity. But I have put a few people, I have a number of very wealthy celebrity uh, patients. And I actually have right. one of my patients, uh, we installed uh, a CVAC at his home. And this guy is yeah. so lucky. I mean, he can go in a CVAC every single day. 
And, so, uh, how's it, so is it working for him? Is he having more energy? Is he losing weight? Or is there any difference? Um, he hasn't lost weight, but um, he has a very, very uh, significant um, genetic uh, pre-diabetic condition. And he's, yeah. it's sta- he's stable. I mean, he's stable. Yeah. His blood sugar is stable. He's not getting any worse. He doesn't have any medical problems. You know, he's very fit and he exercises and he's, he's over 60 years old and he's doing incredibly well. And I think the CVAC is helping him. So how everybody, are in, on CVAC? everybody in this guy's <laughs> family is a diabetic. Everybody is overweight uh-huh. and diabetic except him. Yeah. So uh, how do I get my hands on a CVAC machine? <laughs> well, I, when we're when we're offline, I could I could put you in touch with the guy. He might be interested okay. in, in getting getting a capsule down to Australia. I, um, I, I just know. think uh, I just intuitively when you told me that I was like, this is this is a really good solution. I love this. I I would love to have a CVAC part of my it's part part of what we recommend to everyone somehow to to, to get it to them. But uh, maybe that's a little bit in the future. Now, also, you, you know, you do a lot of really good things with detoxification, and detoxification is an important thing for weight loss, as those of us that follow the Gabriel Method know. So I'm wondering if you could tell us some of the things that you're doing to, to help with detoxification and some of your success stories with that. Well, I will have patients sometimes who are completely resistant to losing weight, and I try everything with them, and they're very compliant, and nothing works. And, 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 and when I get to a patient in that situation, the next thing I think about is that their metabolism has been poisoned. And um, I look to try to explain what's poisoning their metabolism. And I, the first thing I'll check for are heavy metals because heavy metals are everywhere and we're exposed to them. And why will some people get toxic from heavy metals while other people won't? And I think it all has to do with our genetic metabolism. I mean, some people will metabolize the metals and excrete them. And other people won't. I mean, I think that's why we have some autism and other kids don't get autism. Yeah. It has to do with who can, who, can, who can get rid of the metals and who can't. And if you can't yeah. excrete these metals and they build up in your body and then they start to become toxic and then they poison the cell's ability to metabolize. They get into the mitochondria so, and they poison all yeah. the enzyme systems and everything. Yeah. So and by, by the way, people, I just... I, be, yeah, I just want to. Admit, I just did some. I've been doing some research recently, and the most cutting edge kind of um, research says that leptin resistance, which then also causes insulin resistance, et cetera, et cetera, is caused by something called uh, cellular stress, where mm-hmm. the the endoplasmic reticulum has a certain type of stress to it that causes the cell wall to stop being sensitive to to leptin. So that cellular stress is often caused by, by excess toxins as well, especially heavy metals. So, that, so you're spot on on that as, as, a, as a real cause for, for weight gain. Well, I've just seen people get so much better, um, you know, if, I, if I'm able to uncover the fact that they have a metal toxicity. I remember one case had a young woman who was 20 years old. She was a college student in New York and a beautiful girl, smart, and she just couldn't lose weight, and she was probably 25 or 30 pounds overweight, and she was exercising and eating correctly and sleeping, and everything was good. She just could not lose weight. And I did a heavy metal toxicity test on her, and she had toxic levels of mercury. So I yeah. chelated her, and we got the mercury down, and it was unbelievable, uh, John. It was like pulling the plug out of the bathtub, and her weight just <sighs> fell off her. It was incredible. So t- tell me... Tell me about your chelation therapy. Tell, this is your, that's your principal uh, treatment for heavy metal toxicity. Is that right? It's called yeah. chelation therapy? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so let's talk about that. How does that chelation, work? Chelation, the word chelation, the derivation of the word chelation is from Greek, from the word chele, C-H-E-L-E, and that actually means crab. And the reason it comes from that word is because chelation is basically grabbing a hold of these toxic metal molecules and, and removing them from the body. So when you give people a chelator, it's a, it's, a, it's a molecule that traps metal and holds on to it and then gets excreted through the urine or through the, the, the digestive tract so the metals are removed from the body. So um, chelation can be done in a lot of different ways. There are medi- drugs and medications that are chelators, things like DMSA, DMPS, and EDTA. They can be given intravenously or orally. Um, and then there are natural chelators. There are a lot of natural chelators. And the body has the ability to chelate and get rid of toxic metals too. And sometimes just giving people the right um, supplements, antioxidants, things like glutathione, 
can help high doses of vitamin C, antioxidants. A lot of these things will help the body's natural ability to chelate. And then you can also use things like chlorella, which is an algae yeah. product, um, yeah. taking an adequate amount of fiber. If you have high fiber in your diet, you know, that'll tend to bind up key, uh, toxic substances in the digestive tract, and then they'll be excreted in the stool. Um, uh, things and you know things like that um, can be very natural chelators. So there's a lot of different ways to get rid of metals and toxins um, naturally and uh, pharmaceutically. Yeah. Okay. Listen, we, you know we've got a lot of questions that people have written in, and so I'm going to just ask Shannon from my office to call in and and ask us some of those questions. Okay. Shannon, are you there? Hi. Hi, John. Yes. Can you hear me? Hi. I can hear you. Great. I can hear you, but, turn, um, but, but before you go any further, before you go any further, yes? Jenny, turn off your computer. Tell Jenny to turn off her computer because it's, ca it's causing a, uh, a rebound. Okay, she has. Is that better? Okay, go ahead. Yep. All right. First question is from Monique, um, Belgium. She says, mm -hmm. I have been overweight since birth. I've had irregular menstruations and her futism, especially in the face. Is there a natural way to heal it, especially the hirsutism? I would be grateful for any help you can give me. Okay, so just hirsutism, she says facial hair. Is that just yeah. for everyone that's listening? But okay, so yeah. Well, ahead, what, she's describing, yeah. what she's describing are a number of the diagnostic criteria for a condition called polycystic ovary syndrome. And uh, the polycystic ovary syndrome is a very, very frustrating uh, syndrome um, because it, part of the syndrome is insulin resistance and obesity. And what happens is the ovaries are making a lot of cysts and they're not ovulating on a normal schedule. They're not making the normal rhythmic uh, patterns of hormones. And when the hormones are irregular like this, it produces, like we were talking before, it, it can produce stress in the body and abnormal cortisol levels and abnormal hormone levels and all sorts of things like that. Um, patients like this are very, very challenging to me. Uh, what a lot of doctors will do for them is they'll put them on the birth control pill. And again, what they're doing is just treating the symptoms, and that doesn't really correct anything. It just gets the ovaries to stop functioning. Now, sometimes women will feel better on the birth control pill, and their skin might get better, but it usually doesn't help them lose weight and it doesn't correct the problem. What I try to do is I actually look at their hormones and try to get their hormones balanced. Oftentimes, these women have very low estrogen, and they often have high androgens, which are male hormones. So they have high levels of testosterone and DHEA, and they also have a high enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. So in other words, they're converting more estrogen into testosterone. And what oh. I try to do is to balance them and get their testosterone levels down and raise their estrogen levels. And uh, many times that helps, that helps a lot. It depends on how there's all sorts of different levels of this condition. They could be mild to severe. And I've seen young girls with this who don't look abnormal at all. And I've seen other girls who are very overweight and have a lot of facial hair and acne and uh, obesity. So how, how can you how do you how do you treat the uh, how, how can you lower the testosterone level? Um, I often give them uh, five alpha reductase blockers. Salt palmetto is okay. one. Okay. Uh, uh, beta cytosterols will do it too. And if it's very so severe, yeah, I'll go into the prescription, you know, like the Propecia and things like that. Okay. All right, so basically what you're saying for people who are listening is that their, their testosterone levels are too high because they've got an enzyme converting estrogens to testosterone. Is that right? Yeah. The 5-alpha reductase. So, and also their so, ovaries are producing too much testosterone as well. Okay. All right. So, so what, what, what would you recommend? She's in Belgium. What, what would you recommend for her to do? Well, there's actually, there's actually a fantastic hormone doctor in Belgium that I know. Um, a Dr. Terry Hertog, H-E-R-T-O-G-H-E, -H -E, and he's in um, what's what's the big what's the big the capital of Belgium? Do you know? What? Brussels. Oh, Brussels. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's in Brussels. Terry. Okay. Terry. Terry. T h i e r r y Hertog. He's 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 absolutely a brilliant um, hormone specialist, and he has a clinic there. 
and uh, he he would probably be able to help her. That's fabulous. All right, Monique, there you go. So okay, so Shannon, let's. You have another question for us? I know you have Next lots of question. Um, if a lady from Portland says. I have an IUD with low-dose progesterone. I'm very happy with it, but wonder if the added hormone is keeping my fat programs on. Yeah, it does. I've seen this a number of times, and it's called the Mirena IUD, at least in the United States it is, and it secretes progesterone, and it's only supposed to work locally on the lining of the uterus, but I've seen it being absorbed systemically, and I, it creates insulin resistance. It's like taking continuous progesterone like we were talking before, yeah. and it creates insulin resistance. So, so what, what do you recommend that she does? I would remove it, and you could replace it with a regular IUD that doesn't have any hormones on it. I don't know why they're using hormone-embedded IUDs these days. They never did before. It's kind of a yeah, new what, trend. That? Yeah, it, makes, it doesn't make too much sense, does it? I mean, no. either IUD is going to work or, or, it's, or it's not going to work. Yeah, you don't really need the how are you talk Sorry, how, yeah. is Howard talking about the copper IUDs? Yeah, they're, well, the one was used to be called the copper 7, things like that. It's just a standard IUD. It doesn't have any hormones on it. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that would be much right. better because it wouldn't mess up her physiology. It would just be a, yeah. a, 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 a physio, uh, just be a structural way to prevent pregnancy. You know, I, I remember years ago when I, I first started talking to clients and this lady was saying, she says, you know, for the past three months I've been gaining weight. I don't know what's going on. I said, are you on any hormone replacement? And she said, no. And then we're talking and then she goes, actually, I, I take a progesterone cream. And I said, really, how long have you been taking that? And she said, for three months. <laughs> And I said, well, I guess that's, you know, conversation done because apparently when you're taking, and I've seen this with a number of people, where you're, you're taking the hormone on a, on a regular basis, uh, it, it does, it, it, it can cause weight gain. Other times, though, Howard, I've noticed that hormone replacement can sometimes help with, with weight loss in, in menopause. And I'm guessing that's probably based on what you're telling me now because the, the hormone replacement has successfully balanced out the hormones and lowered the stress. Is that possible? Yeah, yeah. And, and if you measure the adrenal glands, you'll find that when women have their hormones replaced and they're balanced, their adrenal glands will calm down and their insulin right. resistance will reverse. I see this all the time, John. It's incredible because I measure, uh, there's a blood test I do called the hemoglobin A1C. Are you familiar with that test? Yeah. yeah. No. So that's the test that where you look at the blood sugar over a long period of time, about three or four months. It gives you a big window of what the blood sugar looks oh, like. Wow. And I follow that in my patients. And I see a lot of women when they come in and they're in menopause and their hemoglobin A1Cs are usually in the high 5, 5.8, 5.9. And I, and I get re- follow-ups on them, you know, four to six months later. And invariably they come down. And that's a mm-hmm. absolutely clinical, you know, proof that these women are less insulin resistant. Wow. That's beautiful. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, so Shani, you want to keep going, hon? Yes. Um, Sandy from Gisborne in New Zealand says, I'm 51 and for the past two years have gained 20 kilograms. What I really struggle with is premenopausal symptoms. I have always been active and did gain the same weight during pregnancy. Now I'm really starting to feel down because I can't seem to break out of the fog, tiredness, stress and always hungry cycle. To top it, I now have UTI. I want to improve my overall health. So what would be the first step you would advise me to take? It sounds to me, you know, like she needs to get her hormones balanced. She's in menopause. She's been in menopause probably 12 years at least. And um, I think it would help to get her hormones balanced. You know, the closer women start to balance their hormones to menopause, the better they do. This is another study that was also done uh, in Europe, and they found that the women who started their hormones closer to menopause, even before they go into menopause, actually do better. And I believe the reason for that is that the body never goes through the shock of losing the hormones. And I have a lot of women that I'll start working with in their late 
their late 40s and they're very sensitive to the hormones and they feel their estrogens declining or their periods are becoming irregular or they're noticing changes in their hair or their skin or they're not sleeping as well. They're very early subtle signs that their hormones are declining. And I'll put those women on hormones where they're still having a normal period. They're absolutely still yeah. having a normal period, but they are in the early stages of premenopause and hormone decline. And when you do that, those women sail right through menopause. They never even know it. They never have a single symptom of menopause. They never gain weight. Nothing changes in their body, and they don't go through the stress of losing their hormones, and they do extremely well. Those women do better than anybody. So, so she's in New Zealand. Where is there some place that you know of that she can go in New Zealand to get the right treatment? Oh, or she should look on the internet for something. Like what yeah, she... I think I would imagine she would have to try to find. I don't know if there's anybody in New Zealand doing hormone balancing. And you know, the thing about hormone balancing is it, it truly is what I would call the art of medicine. You know, it hasn't been formalized yet. It hasn't been standardized. It's still controversial. And if you see ten doctors you'll probably get 10 different opinions on hormones. Yeah. Yeah. So it's hard for me to recommend somebody because it's very few people do it the way I do it. <laughs> can, you, can, can, you, can you treat people remotely? I can do that. Uh, the only thing is I can't write prescriptions. But what I could do yeah. is I could outline a plan and I could tell her what she should get. And then if she could find a local doctor who would be willing to write those prescriptions for her, I could continue to work with her uh, long distance. I could either do it by Skype or by phone. Now, I'm just curious, Howard, is, that some, is the, the plan that you would write for her, is that something that would be standardized or is it, or is it very unique based, based on whatever profile she's going to have? It's, it's unique. Uh, I would, I would okay. look, at her, I'd look at her numbers, you know, consider her age, consider yeah. if she has any other medical problems, and I kind of get a gestalt for how well she's going to tolerate hormones. Some women, I, I, believe, I believe for men and women, I believe there are some people who are what I call high hormone people, high, hor high testosterone men, high estrogen women, and then there are other people, this is before they lose their hormones, this is when they're young, yeah. and then there are some yeah. people who are low testosterone men and low estrogen women. If you measure, I've, I've actually done this, I have two sons. I have a boy who's 27, and I have another boy who's 20, my 27-year-old is very, very smart. He's, he's, he's intellectual. He's not athletic, you know, and, and I, I measured his testosterone. He's a completely normal kid. You know, he has a great libido. He has a girlfriend. You know, he's very hairy. I mean, for, for all purposes, you'd say he looks like an absolutely perfectly normal boy, man. And I measured his testosterone, and his testosterone was about half of my younger boy's testosterone, who's a, who's a jock. Uh, but and but would that would, would the would the age account for any of that? Because it's no, usually like no, no. You know, when you're nineteen twenty. No. Okay. No, no. The difference between a twenty year old and a twenty seven year old should be no difference. There there okay. are just men normally who have different levels of hormone. And if you look at the reference range, if you look at a lap slip and you look at the reference range, that's why it's so wide, because this is how they came up with the reference range. They drew blood on hundreds and hundreds of normal people. And they found out that testosterone runs from 240 to 970. That's a huge spectrum, wow. you know? That's unbelievable. Yeah. And the reason for that is that you have what I call high testosterone men and, and, and women with high estrogen and low. And, you know, you, so you, if you do a blood test on somebody, you know, you look at it and it's like low normal. Well, the, the, really, the real way to evaluate that is like, what was their level like when they were 25 or 30 years old? We don't have that luxury to have those tests. That's what I'd love to have, you know, yeah. is to have the person's baseline. And then when you correct them, you correct them back to where they were. But you take somebody who normally has 300 and he's at 275, you know, he's not much different. He, he probably yeah. doesn't need much hormone. And I wonder. I don't know if I don't know if the the information is out there. If you could even answer this, but I'm wondering what the rate, what the relationship is between if you're a high t a high hormone person and the, the the rate of declining when you do start to decline. Do you decline at a quicker rate and an accelerated rate? Does it cause more stress, or or do you do you fare better during the declining years? What what's been your? Do you have any information on that at all? Um, that's a really interesting point. Um, I don't, I don't know if anybody has looked at that. Um, you know, what I do know is that premenopause can be as long as 10 years. 
Um, and I've yeah. seen women, I've actually seen women as young as 38 in full blown menopause, full blown menopause yeah. at 38. And then I've yeah. seen other women in their early to mid forties. And a lot of women, you know, the thing that's very interesting is that women are very sensitive. A lot of women are very, very sensitive to their physiology and they'll go to the doctor and they'll go, you know, something's not right. I don't feel right. I, something is changing my body. And the doctor will do some blood tests and they'll go, everything is fine. You know, and then they'll offer them, you know, a sleeping pill or an anti-anxiety pill or an antidepressant pill, something to treat the symptoms. But what they don't understand is that these women, even in their early 40s, are already experiencing the symptoms of less estrogen than they used to have. And I have women like this in my practice, and I can I can tell what they're talking about. And I'll give them a little bit of estrogen, very very small amounts of estrogen, but it'll just bring them back to where they were, say five years before, and they and, they, and they're, they're so sorted. happy, so happy. Yeah, yeah. It's very easy yep. to fix because they just need like a little nudge, you know. What what about all the estrogen in in our water supply and the plastics and drinking water and in 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 phytoestrogens and the foods in wheat bread? Like what I'm hearing is that there's just that, that a lot of the that just the normal everyday diet that that we're eating these days is is causing hormonal havoc on us. Is that yeah? Are, are you? I, what, I think that's what, true. What there, that? there, yeah. I just saw an article on Medscape. Um, where they were talking about a population of people where a lot of the women are on birth control pills. I forget where the population was. It was a study done, and there yeah, was a higher incidence. This, yeah. <clears throat> there was a higher yeah. incidence of prostate cancer. <clears throat> yeah, with the women on birth control yeah. pills, and they're trying to connect. Why is there more prostate cancer where these where these women are on birth control pills? And one of the things they came up with is that the the urine uh, that was being excreted from these women. Uh, into the water supply was carrying higher levels of estrogen, just like you're talking about. These are environmental estrogens, exactly. and it was getting into the food supply and, and, and affecting the men. Exactly. <clears throat> That's exactly what, what, what I've heard, and I've also heard that it's affecting – you know, it, it, it's affecting the, the fish population because the fish uh-huh. become less fertile, male fish are less fertile, it's, and it's just affecting us in every way. And also, what about the estrogens – uh, in the plastics or estrogen mimickers in the plastics in the, in yeah. the drinking waters and bottled waters. Is that, is that, yeah. how, how does that, how uh, does that work? Well, I, I, rec- I strongly recommend avoiding plastic bottles, plastic containers, and especially for water and all that kind of stuff as much as possible. Yeah. Um, I, right. I think you're right. I mean, they have, they're chemically similar to natural estrogens and they, and, and that's probably where a lot of cancer is coming from. You know, people are yeah. afraid of estrogen. We should be more afraid of, the, of these toxic substances in our food than what's going yeah. on with hormone replacement. Yeah. Now, I, and I just want to say real quickly, you know, we don't have too much time left. But I've got a, we've got a lot of listeners at the moment. And for those of you that are listening, you know, if, if you want to talk to Howard, this is, a, this is an opportunity to talk to the world leading authority on the, on holistic natural hormone balancing you, just press one if you want to talk to him and then shannon i'm gonna we, i know you've got a bunch more questions let's try to get through some more of your questions but if you do want to talk to him this is a true opportunity people and you know go, people go, ahead, go to if people yeah. go to my website it's uh, leibowitzlongevity.com you can go to my website yeah. i have a free conference call i do every wednesday night from california it's six. I mean, not every Wednesday, every other Wednesday uh, from California. You can sign up for my newsletter, and then I'll be sending out notices. I'm doing one next Wednesday night. Actually, this is why that's, we scheduled for tonight, is this is one of my off right. Wednesdays. Right. That, that's, that's Leibowitz Longevity Center, everyone. Or if you just go on the Internet and you hit up Howard Leibowitz, and the, you'll you'll see the Leibowitz Longevity Center and go to his go to his web page. He's got a, he's got yeah. an excellent newsletter. I mean, you can see that this man is just knowledge, industrial strength knowledge of everything that you want to know about naturally balancing your your hormones. So I recommend you definitely get onto get onto his newsletter. Shan, you want to ask a couple more questions? Yes, um, this one's from Catherine uh, from Portland. I am in recent post-breast cancer treatment with estrogen blocker therapy for the next five years. What steps can I take now that I have been thrown into chemopause and am taking tamoxifen? I may be put on aromatase inhibitors in five months. I would really like to lose 60 pounds. 
I have taken off 10 in the last year during cancer treatment, in part thanks to the tools I have been using from Mr. Gabriel's book and site. This is a very challenging um, person uh, because they've already experienced, you know, the the cancer problem and um, using hormones in cancer, breast cancer patients especially, is, is very, very controversial. There are people doing it. Um, I've actually treated some women uh, who've had breast cancer um, with with estrogen. Um, and, you know, uh, Suzanne Summers uh, talks about this. She's a breast cancer survivor, and she's on hormones herself. Um, it is very controversial. It's a very, very personal decision to decide to do this, and it really becomes a question of quality of life. So uh, being on these estrogen blockers like tamoxifen and the aromatase inhibitors and things like that really tremendously lowers your estrogen, and a lot of women will absolutely be miserable when they have no estrogen like that, and it becomes a question of quality of life. I mean, are you okay living like that, or are you so miserable that you want to take your chances and, and hopefully the cancer won't come back. And there are a lot of other things you can do in addition to the hormones or not hormones. And I think, you know, John's diet is, is a perfect example of the way you should be eating, whether you've had cancer or not. But certainly if you've had cancer, I think, you know, eating this paleo style diet and doing the work that John does with, with the um, lowering the uh, cortisols and the, the sleep and the meditations and those types of things are all very, very helpful in helping to decrease the stressors on the body. Um, but replacing hormones in breast cancer uh, survivors is, is, is really needs to be talked out uh, extensively with your, with your healthcare practitioner and come to a decision, very, very personal decision. It's, there's no blanket answer to the question like that. Now, now you, you, you work with Suzanne Summers, is that right? Yeah. Uh, I'm a friend of hers, and we talk from time to time, and um, I know her pretty well. Yeah. And okay, and so so what I've seen also with just in general, I just want to talk about cancer and chemotherapy. Is I've seen people go eat one of either ways, one of two ways with chemotherapy. I'm sure you have too. Is they either they lose a lot of weight or they gain a lot of weight. Yeah, and I'm, yeah. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, on on what what would cause one person to go one way or the other. Well, it's it's a little bit difficult to know. I mean, one of the things I know about chemotherapy. <laughs> is that, first of all, it absolutely kills the appetite in a lot of people, and it also poisons the metabolism, you know? So, yeah. you know, yeah. if people are not eating, a lot of people who go through chemotherapy don't eat. They just have no appetite right. at all. Um, obviously, yeah. those people are going to start to lose weight, and they're in a tremendous amount of uh, metabolic demand. Uh, their bodies are trying to heal, and, and, they're also, they're met and their metabolism is so distorted from the, from the toxins of the chemotherapy um, that you're just not dealing with normal physiology anymore. Right. So it really becomes a question of which one wins out, the, the appetite, the low appetite, or the, or the, the uh, metabolism being, being poisoned, which one's yeah. going to win out in terms of the, uh, the, the weight struggle. Makes uh, sense. I think so. All right, so, so Shan, we'll have one more question, and then we're going to have to let our good friend Dr. Leibowitz go for the day. But Go ahead and ask us one more question, Shane. Okay. Um, well, a couple of women have asked a similar one about having a hysterectomy, um, either a full hysterectomy or where they leave one ovary present, and has that affected their weight? Yeah, that's a great question, and I see this all the time. And uh, what happens is um, when the uh, hysterectomy is performed, first of all, if the total hysterectomy is being performed, the ovaries are removed. And if the ovaries are removed, you have no hormones. So those women are what I call being put into, into surgical menopause. That's surgical menopause. Their ovaries are removed and they have no hormones. They're going to gain weight just because they go into huge stress, tremendous stress. Their bodies from one minute to the next have lost their hormones. That's a tremendous stress on the body. And they're going to develop all the syndrome that we've been talking about that John talks about with insulin resistance and cortisol and all of that. You can replace those hormones, however. The good news is you can replace those hormones. And I have a lot of women in, who've had hysterectomies who are very, very well balanced hormonally. The women who have the partial hysterectomies, that means the uterus is removed and the ovaries are left behind. And a lot of times they don't do very well either. You'd think they should because they have their ovaries. And this is women before menopause, obviously, so their ovaries are still ovulating. But sometimes what happens is the arteries that are cut 
that take out the uterus also supply blood to the ovary. And those ovaries then end up with a much diminished blood supply, and they also have a diminished hormone production. <clears throat> so those women, even though they have their ovaries, they're making a lot less hormone than they used to. And they're not really in menopause, but they're what I would call a surgical premenopause. And that's why they end okay. up uh, many times gaining weight. You, um, you know what? Speaking of the, speaking of the, the blood supply and the capillaries, there's a lot of work being done recently with these. Um, what is the word anti antiogens or something that that cause your capillary your blood level your blood capillaries to multiply? And yeah, uh, it's a, for cancer in uh, cancer patients. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. What, what what is it called? Anti antiogenesis or something like that? Uh, anti angiogenesis. Angiogenesis. An angio means yeah, because cancer cells produce a hormone that creates the development. Cancer cells, I mean, if you think about something growing in the body like that, they have to get a blood supply. So they actually create the infrastructure to create, right. to bring the blood to themselves, to supply themselves with the nutrients they need to grow. Right. Um, so, they, so, they, so they produce a, a hormone that stimulates the growth of blood vessels. And there are right. chemotherapeutic drugs now that are anti-angiogenic drugs that block the growth of blood vessels so that they starve what, out the cancer. What, what they found, I, I was reading recently, what they found is a byproduct of that is, is oftentimes weight loss. And, and, I, and I, 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 I haven't seen anything what the reason is, but it, it seems to me m one of the reasons might be that maybe somehow it, pre it prevents uh, um, uh, adipocytes, small the the cells, the fat cells, from multiplying the That's way possible. they do when you gain weight. Yeah. So I, and then so what? Right. Right. And so what I've been looking into is is natural treatments, natural foods that you can eat that are naturally anti angiogenesis, mm. and uh, and I have a feeling that they'll probably be very useful in weight loss. That's very interesting. And, yeah. Anyway, listen. Uh, for, for uh, on behalf of everyone that's listening, Dr. Leibowitz, this has just been an incredible, incredible class, and your your breadth of knowledge of holistic medicine is is unsurpassed in this world. I'm convinced of it. And I I just I love talking to you. I know that everyone's going to appreciate it immensely. And uh, again, please go to Dr. to Dr. Leibowitz's site. It's the Leibowitz Longevity Center. Just hit up Howard Leibowitz. On your uh, on your computer, and he'll come up. Leave it with longevity center. Get onto his his email, his 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 newsletter. It's very informative. Go, uh, uh, participate in his in his weekly his his or his biweekly talks, conference calls. It's it's an opportunity. It really is, and we're all very lucky to have you. So, Howard, thanks very much for joining us. Okay, thank you, John, and I all hope right. to talk to you soon. I I hope so too. Great. I okay. hope to see you soon too. Okay. All right. My, Be well. See ya. That's my, that's my big brother in health and wellness, Dr. Lee Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>